All right. All right, everybody, if we can take our seats, please. We call to order the meeting for the House, uh, Salem Housing Authority for the City of Salem for Monday, August 28th, 2023. Would the quarter please call the roll? Commissioner Nishioka. Second. I, yeah. You're here. Are I'm you here. here. Okay. <laughs> Vice Chair Phillips. Here. Commissioner Gwynn. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Hoy. Here. Commissioner Nordyke. Here. Commissioner Varney. Here. Resident Commissioner Viegas. Here. Chair Stapleton. I'm here. Thank you. All right. Vice Chair Phillips, do we have, oh, I guess we have our Pledge of Allegiance. Would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thanks. I pledge Thank you. All right, now I'll ask you the question. Do we have any additions or deletions? Not tonight. Okay, thank you. And do we have any public comment? Not tonight. All right, Vice Chair Phillips, the consent calendar. I move the consent calendar. I'll second that. Thank you. Moved by Phillips, seconded by Nishioka. So our consent calendar consists of the uh, item 3.1A, which is the July 24th, 2023 Draft Salem Housing Authority Minutes. And that concludes the consent calendar. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, with the recorder please call the roll. Vice Chair Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Hoy. Aye. Commissioner Nordyke. Aye. Commissioner Varney. Aye. Commissioner Nishioka. Aye. Resident Commissioner Viegas. Aye. Chair Stapleton. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. We have no public hearings tonight and no special orders of business, but we do have, if I might say, the most beautiful information report that I've ever seen. Um, and we do have Nicole Utes here. Would you like to go ahead and start us off with just an overall briefing and then we can go to questions? Sure, I'm Nicole Yutz. I'm the Housing Administrator for Salem Housing Authority. And tonight I wanted to inform you that Sequoia's progress is at 70% and is staying on track. It's been ahead back and forth, but we know we'll get that by the end of January for sure. Um, it's uh, become very vibrant and beautiful. Hopefully if you drive down the Martin Luther King Boulevard, you'll take notice of this new structure and its vibrant colors. Um, they do have a meeting where we are getting a lot of feedback um, that's positive. In fact, we own the complex next door and our residents now want us to paint Parkway very brightly and uh, make it also as vibrant. So that pink scheme actually um, helps institute just so that everybody is aware. Um, that is a reflection of water, earth, uh, trees uh, and, and metal. It's a piece of nature in all of that project design and it's supposed to have a calming effect even though it does seem very bright at the moment and we look forward to showing it off as we get closer to a uh, completion. A uh, little progress update at Yaquana Hall. We are fully occupied at Yaquana Hall which is very exciting. We are starting to stabilize and we're working towards our permanent loan. We hope to get to perm loan by October. We do have to show the banks that we have uh, stable financials for several months. Um, and so we're working with our banks on that currently. This is total normal process and we're, we're, we're right on schedule. Um, we're focusing on building a community there and it's been pretty exciting. They're doing Taco Tuesdays, they're meeting and greeting each other. Um, I've had the fortune of being out there again for a little while this past month, as well as Redwood Crossings, and it's really great to see the progress and stabilization from uh, coming outdoors to the indoors. Um, we have a new uh, hire from Arches that will become the Supportive Service Coordinator. We're very excited. They're going to get started right after Labor Day, so they have been help supplementing um, with various different program coordinators, but now we will have a full-time one starting um, this upcoming month that we'll be able to get to know each of the residents. Um, the, we do have some current openings uh, on our website, and we want everybody to take notice. This is a great opportunity for Parkway West, um, Sequoia Crossings, and then Mahonia Crossings, which we have project-based vouchers in. 
I would also encourage people who need affordable housing to watch Maconia Crossing's website. We have 52 of the project-based vouchers. They have over 300 units at that location. So um, they run their own uh, affordable housing waiting list for that site. When we recently opened our voucher program waiting list, we received in a very short period of time 1,800 applications for that uh, program. Um, we did uh, send staff to, and kids to Camp Rosenbaum. We'll uh, be able to highlight all of that in your next program report. We've had a very, very busy August, a lot of community outreach events. Um, and then, of course, we're very proud of our own national night out. Um, that we held and we were impressed with all the coordination, the staff coordination. Um, we did not only had it for our residents, the neighborhood, our staff and our staff's family to be able to come out and enjoy a night, um, national night out there. So, and I, I must say that I do hope that you like the program management report. This is a new style. You will see it grow and expand upon this. This is also a part of our strategic plan um, and our, our growing effort that we've expanded our staffing. Um, so we do have a communications person. So please follow us on Facebook to keep up to date on what we're doing at the Housing Authority. Um, our website is being continually worked on now, and uh, she's also gathering information and building upon this program management report. This was the very first one, and we wanted to say that um, we want you to know about all the programs that we do, not just the highlights of what we do. There's a lot of staff there. They work very, very hard every single day, and each of those departments have a lot going on. So we want to be able to highlight something for you every month. We also want you to be able to learn about our projects that we have going on and our apartment complexes so you can get a little bit to know about each one of them. So I'm open for any questions. Great, thank you. And and I know that um, this has really been a driving thing uh, to increase our communication and to really um, share with the community all the great work that's happening at Salem Housing Authority. I know for um, for the council and for um, us here um, in this space as well. So thank you so much. I'm glad that we have that new hire and that there's extra space and time um, and manpower or person power to get this done. So it's a beautiful report. I look forward to seeing it as it evolves even more. Um, any questions? Councilor Varney, did you have one? Or Commissioner? Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. I don't really have a question. I just, when I saw this, I thought, oh my goodness, this needs to be framed. Um, I really appreciate the detail about the individual programs, projects, because uh, so many times we just hear an acronym or just a name and I don't have something to associate it with. And I'm keeping this as a reference document so that I can keep tracking things. And so I just wanted to say thank you. You're welcome. We are working very hard to not use our other language that we speak um, and, and hopefully make this more fluid and easier to understand, so. Great, Commissioner Hoy. Thank you, just a quick question. I heard you mention someone coming from Arches to help and did that happen internally or is that someone that so we have an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding for Supportive Services on site um, at uh, Yaquina Hall. Um, when we had a former Supportive Services contract and MOU signed, unfortunately they um, were not able to fulfill that right at the grand opening of our pro property. So Salem Housing Authority, um, including myself and others, have been out there uh, filling that gap and that need uh, until we could uh, gather all the people that need to be at that site. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Nishioka. Thank you. I, too, want to just compliment this program and when uh, the, the um, layout of this and the information that's provided. And the first thing I thought of is, oh boy, could we get something similar to take to the neighborhood associations in the sense that then we can present all the great work because I usually come and just make a statement about you know one one apartment complex or one housing, and it would be lovely to have more people understand all the work 
that you're doing. So, Absolutely. I would encourage when you go to the neighborhood association meetings, and our goal is to also increase our presence at that. Um, but we do have a subscribe now online on our website, and this will be converted into what is called our uh, SHA magazine, and okay. we will be getting that out to anybody who monthly subscribes. So we are trying to increase our communications broadly to whoever wants to receive it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. I don't think we have anything else on the agenda. Thank you so much for being here and the great report. We are adjourned. Thank you. Call this meeting of the Urban Renewal Agency for the City of Salem for Monday, August 28, 2023 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Board Member Stapleton. I'm here. Board Member Nishioka. Here. Board Member Phillips. Here. Board Member Gwynn. Here. Board Member Gonzalez. Here. Board Member Hoy. Here. Board Member Nordyke. Here. Board Member Varney. Here. Chair Hoy. Here. All right. Councilor Stapleton, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Not tonight. Thank you. We have nobody signed up for public comment for the Urban Rural Agency. Councilor Stapleton, the consent calendar. Thank you. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. On the consent calendar tonight, we have item 3.1A, which is the um, July 24th, 2023 draft Urban Renewal Agency minutes. And item 3.2A, which is a minor amendment to the Riverfront Downtown Urban Renewal plan to add a paid parking technology infrastructure and financial and communication outreach consulting service services project to the plan and that concludes our consent calendar thank you is there any discussion and i would just note that we do have ms rutherford online if folks uh need uh if have questions for her councillor nordyke uh I did have some questions under, but I see it's actually under item six information report, so I think it can wait. All right, any further discussion? Will the recorder please call the roll? Board Member Gwynn. Aye. Board Member Gonzalez. Aye. Board Member Hoy. Aye. Board Member Nordyke. Aye. Board Member Varney. Aye. Board Member Stapleton. Aye. Board Member Nishioka? Aye. Board Member Phillips? Aye. Chair Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. All right, we have no public hearings and no special orders of business, but we do have one information report. Councilor Nordyk, did you have a question? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I did, and I do believe it'll be a question for Director Rutherford. So I was just looking at the fiscal year procurement contracts, and I see that there's a Salem Convention Center marking an agreement for $477,000 uh, with Salem Group LLC. I was just wondering if Director Rutherford could explain what, what the marketing agreement is and what the goals are for that agreement. Yes, I'm happy to speak to this. Kristen Rutherford, Urban Development Community and Urban Development Director. Um, this is the marketing agreement has been in place since the convention center opened and with each renewal of the contract. So the reason behind this is that this is the city of set and we want it to be successful. Um, and so we fund the marketing portion um, of that operation. And that is a pass through through the Urban Renewal Agency from TOT funds. So if I may, Mr. Mayor. Sure. So can you give us an example of what are we actually paying for with this market agreement? What services are being rendered as a result? Sure, this is paying for staff and this is paying for um, outreach and marketing to different kinds of um, like um, trade shows, you know, where they are out recruiting for different conferences and doing a marketing of the facility to different types of associations um, that would make use of the convention center. So it's personnel and actual marketing efforts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the information report? Uh, Councillor Gwynn. So I was curious about item number three and McGilchrist and the change order, adding a million. 
Is, is the question specifically about what that million dollars is for? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I am going to call on our public works director to speak to that. So this is an urban renewal funded project, but the project is managed by the public works department. So I'm going to look to see if Brian is there. He, he is. Good, e good evening, uh, Brian Martin, Public Works Director. I do not have that staff report in front of me. Is it with OTAC by chance? It, it is, is with OTAC, yes. So that's for the final design services uh, for the second two phases, the second and third phase of uh, the McGill, McGill Chris Street project. So uh, the first phase is the intersection of 22nd Street, which is under construction now, and they need to take the remaining sections from 60% complete design to final design. Any further questions? All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have no further business for the Urban Renewal Agency, so we're adjourned. And I'll call to order this meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, August 28th, 2023 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Councilor Stapleton. Here. Councilor Nishioka. Here. Councilor Phillips. Here. Councilor Gwynn. Here. Councilor Gonzalez? Here. Councilor Hoy? Here. Councilor Nordyke? Here. Councilor Varney? Here. Mayor Hoy? Here. Could I just remind folks to be sure and silence your cell phones? Uh, we've had a couple go off already, so if you could just be sure and check and make sure they're on silence, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Councilor Stapleton, any additions or deletions to the agenda? Not tonight. All right. It is now time for a council and city manager comment. Do we have any? Councilor Nishioka. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. Um, I just wanted to remark that I participated in the Battle of the ba uh, Badges blood donation. Where'd you go? Police. Ooh. I went to the police, but next year I shall donate to the fire. <laughs> and um, and I just wanted to remark it's a good um, a good cause. Uh, Councillor Varney and I had the opportunity to go out to Garen Island Water Treatment Facility, which was a very interesting um, uh, uh, observation and, and and you know looking at the treatment facility and amazing all the work that uh, the city does to ensure that we have safe drinking water. It was a, it was a beautiful day, it was a wonderful time, it was like having a picnic. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. And then also, uh, fairly recently, um, Councillor Nordyke and I attended the Fairmont Readiness Fair, which they refer to as FERT, somewhat like CERT, and it's their emergency readiness team. and. Um, the neighbors have gotten together this amazing program so it doesn't feel so overwhelming to get yourself ready for emergencies and how to help you put your to-go kits. And I'm hoping that um, the, the program that they've developed could be used by other neighborhoods, but it was um, really nice to be uh, invited and get to see what they have done. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, on a different day, I got to go out to Garen Island as well, and it really was a fabulous tour. Thank you to Mark Bechtel and to our public works director um, for going out there with us and, and showing us around. And um, it was just really great to be able to see uh, physically what we're talking about in meetings. Um, you know, when we're talking about dam replacements and the needed work that, that needs to get done out there to ensure um, that, our, that our drinking water continues uh, to be as good as it is now. Um, it's so wonderful to go out there and see it so that you can better understand it in meetings. So thank you for taking the time. I know all of us are really grateful, uh, those of us who got to go. So um, thank you for that. Um, I also did want to say that I went down to Capital Pride with my family this weekend. It was fabulous. It was well attended. There were so many booths um, and really just a wonderful time had um, by all of us there. Um, so thank you to the folks who put that on. Uh, wonderful event. Um, I wanted to give a, a little heads up. I'm going to be um, 
doing a show with CC Media on the Art Community Matters um, program uh, with Salem Housing Authority, and we're going to be talking about housing. Um, so I'm really excited to get um, in there and try and do my best to communicate with the with the community about um, just the struggles that we're having in our community. Every community across across the states uh, are really struggling with this. Um, so excited for that. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about pedestrian safety. Um, shockingly, uh, this last week, one of my family members was walking home from work and was in a crosswalk and was hit by a car. Um, they survived. I won't say they're okay. I think um, it was really, really traumatic for everybody. Um, they live with us, and so uh, we got to see the bruises kind of bloom on their body and help them treat their road rash on the other side of their body um, and just kind of hold their hand as they went through um, just the psychological trauma of being hit by a car. Um, you know, the, the driver who, who hit them was blinded by the sun um, and couldn't see them in the crosswalk. And so uh, just really, it's, it's, you all know me, this is something that I'm really, um, really passionate about, um, about pedestrian safety, about bike safety, uh, when it comes to folks, all transportation users um, within our system. And uh, so I am glad they're okay um, and uh, that, that we, it wasn't any worse. Um, but I wanted to just bring that here um, to remind everybody. It was a couple days after I was sitting at on uh, Center Street at 12th and saw somebody crossing in front of me um, and almost got hit by somebody turning. And then they tried to cross the other way when they had the light and, of course, almost got hit again. Um, and so it's just really, it's really hard to be a policymaker and experience things like this and know that with policy we try to shape human behavior and it's just so hard to do that work. Um, and it's, it's just something I've been witnessing a lot lately and I wanted to bring it here as just a way to, to put a spotlight on it and thank you for listening. Thank you, Councilor. I'm sorry that happened to your family member. Any other comments? Councilor Nordyke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A few things. Uh, first of all, for those who did not tune in to the Salem Housing Authority meeting that was held moments ago, I highly recommend it. They have a brand new report that is an excellent snapshot of all the work that is happening by some of our unsung heroes every day to address the affordable housing crisis in our city. So kudos to Executive Director Nicole Utes and her entire staff for all the work that they do. Um, as Councillor Nishioka mentioned, there was a emergency preparedness event in Fairmont Hill. And I want to just uh, highlight, bedazzle, underscore, sprinkle. Did I mention highlight yet? I think I did. Everything she said. Uh, this is a completely replicable model. Uh, our neighborhoods can plan for disaster, and they should. And it's really not that hard if you do it step by step. And Paul and Katya in the Fairmont Hill neighborhood have done an excellent job of allowing people to baby step their way to emergency preparedness. And, you know, I used to scoff at that, but that was before I was a counselor and I came to know firsthand just how many emergencies arise in the city that may have nothing to do with me personally. At this particular event, this was their third annual emergency preparedness fair. Uh, so they're already ahead of the game. They had games for kids. They had updates on their neighborhood mapping project, information about caring for pets in a disaster, examples of what a go bag should look like, and a lot more. So if you're interested in bringing this concept to your neighborhood association, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to connect you with the, uh, the brilliant minds behind FERT. While we're on the subject of emergencies, I want to give uh, kudos and thank yous to our fire crews, our dispatchers, and all of our other first responders who rushed to aid in the South Salem fire. Thank you so much to all of our firefighters and everyone else who sprang to action to preserve life and property that day. Uh, this is a powerful reminder that wildfires can happen very close to home. Uh, we can have ice storms, we can have heat storms, we can have unhealthy breathing conditions from wildfires in our area. So if you have not done so, please sign up to get the community alerts on your phone, 
They can be texted to you. They can be called. They can be emailed. What or all three? I don't judge, but I do think it would be a good idea if everyone signed up for that. Um, that I think would do a, go a long ways in ensuring that people take care of themselves and then assist their neighbors is appropriate. And then capitalizing on uh, what Councillor Stapleton said, Pride in the Park was a gorgeous event. Congratulations to Capital Pride for yet another extremely successful event. I don't know what the final numbers are, but several thousand would be a reasonable estimate of how many folks were in attendance. My organization, Casa Marin County, was proud to bring a booth to that event. And we had a lot of people just say, thank you, Casa, for being here. It really sends a message. And I was so pleased to see so many other community partners present, uh, including a number of houses of worship, a number of community partners like Punks in the Park, uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs and private businesses as well. So I'm a big believer in this community, and I also believe that our LGBTQ plus community has always been there. They've always been living here, but have we always had a Pride in the Park event that truly celebrates and allows people to show up as they are and feel safe doing so? No, we haven't. So this is a new-ish phenomenon, and I'm really just so ecstatic and so pleased with the organizers. They even came by our booth during the day just to check in with us. Do you guys have everything you need? How was the process getting here? Do you need extra water bottles? Uh, so they really did uh, an outstanding job in organizing the event, and I will look forward to going back next year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And just as a reminder, if you're interested in signing up for the Community Alerts, you can go to the City of Salem webpage at cityofsalem.net and just type in Community Alerts in the search bar, and that'll take you right through the process. It's really simple. Are there any other comments? Councillor Phillips. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to take a moment to uh, talk about an event that um, my younger brother, who's a resident of South Salem, um, got to have last month and the family, our large family, was invited to. Uh, my brother got to, uh, was promoted and also had a retirement celebration for his 20 years of uh, service to our country. He had 11 years of full active duty in the Army and then the, the final nine years were in the Army Reserves. Um, it was a very moving event. Uh, there were several retirements and just going and seeing, you know, the community come together from multiple families and, and the staff that worked there um, on behalf of our country was really uh, hard to put into words, but it, it had a, a moving uh, you know, impact on me. Um, it was really fun to hear about, you know, the, the experiences my brother had in his speech um, during his retirement. And I just wanted to wish him a congratulations. Uh, so congratulations, Lieutenant Colonel Kyle Phillips. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Councillor Hoy. Thank you. I'm proud to be sporting my Oregon State Fair t-shirt tonight. We've got the Geppetto's food trailer there in the Artisan Village with other local food vendors. It feels like it's back. Mm -hmm. The fair, that is, the state fair. Like a pre-COVID kind of event. Lots of people and lots of happy, smiling faces. The fair means I'm back on my fair diet, not all at once. <laughs> but over the 11 day event, I must at some point consume corn on the cob with butter and salt only, check. A smoked turkey leg, check. Oregon Dairy Women's Swirl Cone, check, check. <laughs> and yet to come, a hand dipped corn dog with mustard only. At this point, I'm so far ahead of the game, I may have to start my diet all over again. Last Friday morning, I had the pleasure, along with Mayor Hoy and Councillor Gonzalez, of attending the Walmart Grand Opening on North Lancaster, Grand Reopening. That store made our life affordable as a young family. I'm just thankful they chose to double down and reinvest in the neighborhood. I get calls from constituents about the homeless camping on the Walmart property entrances. It's harder for campers now because a big chunk of Walmart's reinvestment went to covering any and all green spaces with great big rocks to discourage campers. I passed by campers on my way to the event in time to witness drug users unabashedly injecting themselves next to the Walmart driveway. I let the division manager and store manager know that I see them and I hear them when it comes to their need for help. We have to do better as a city for businesses throughout and for the young family who sees the same stuff and more every day 
just trying to get to football practice. What is seemingly unacceptable should not be. The action item this night, how about we, the counselors and the mayor, write a letter to the governor requesting a repeal of Measure 110. It would be a start. And even if it won't work, at least we're trying to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And just as a, a side note on the State Fair, um, if you happen to be out there, stop by the Sister City Water Booth. Thank you to Deputy Sis City Manager Christian Nambori, who helped uh, volunteer there yesterday. I, I spent a few hours there selling water for our Sister City program, and it's right next to Fat Schlogs, the best hand-dipped corn dog that I've found at the fair so far. So I checked that one off yesterday. Any other comments? All right, let's move on then to public comment. All right, as a reminder, if you come on down to the, when your name is called, hit the button so the green light comes on, introduce yourself with either your address or your ward. You have three minutes. When the yellow light flashes, that means you have one minute remaining, and when the red light comes on, that means your time is up. So please end your comments at that time. First, we will start with Curtis Grubbs. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Honorable Mayor Chris Hoy and Council. My name is Curtis Grubbs. I live in Ward uh, 1 uh, at uh, 211 Court Street. I'm a former mayor and resident of, of City of Wilhelmina and, and now uh, a resident of this great city. One, I came to you uh, about three or four weeks ago in regards to the uh, the tax issue and I want to congratulate you on knowing how to get people to come out and get an interest in, in things. When we have controversial issues, we seem to draw a crowd, and that's the only a lot of times that we get citizen involvement in it, uh, and it's so sad. Um, but at the same time, the I ask you to rescind this issue with uh, the tax. You chose not to. Again, I'm here today to ask you to rescind the the tax now that the citizens have spoke with a large number with um, with their vote in the signature gathering. Um, you know, you chose not to listen to us uh, at the first meeting, but uh, now again, I ask you to rescind this. Uh, do the right thing um, and listen to the citizens. Uh, I support uh, Council Member Julia Julie Hoyt's amendment to re to rescind the to rescind this tax. One, the citizens have spoken. Uh, two, the cost of having a special election. Three, uh, we are in a recession. Uh, for and I really haven't seen a whole lot of cost-cutting measures being done in the budget. Um, if you truly have a passion for this, I ask that you might uh, go before the citizens like you have done in many times before and, and give them the opportunity and present to them why and what the reasons is for, for this type of special need for it. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Steve Anderson. Mr. Anderson, I see that you're signed up for 3.1A, which is our minutes. Yes. Okay. I'm speaking directly to council actions, no new testimony per the request on the minutes on the sheet. Okay, so Steve Anderson, Ward 8, West Salem Neighborhood Association. I've always been taught to look to virtue in the lives of actions of others. However, I'm having a tough time with the council's failure to perform their civic duty in the sitting of a quasi-judicial body on the Titan Hill and deliberations. We were treated to the dark side of politics and money. Council members clearly abandoned their integrity and credibility. Silence prevailed. I understand many of you are new to the council process, have little or no experience dealing with these proceedings, and being charged with looking at all the contested issues and facts. Couple this with the city attorney sending the council an email outside public view where he chose not to explain your duties and responsibilities. The absence of deliberations, 
in the minutes upon the evidence of 51 disputed claims screams that the fix was in. Failing to address our request to investigate compliance with tree code ordinance demonstrated a complete lack for the citizens of West Salem and their needs. Our evidence showed clearly that the applicant just asked for a tree code variance. Nothing else was done to follow the requirements. We offered step-by-step -step examples of how to comply and maintain the density requested. Council could have denied the tree code variance like staff did with the parking variance, then offer the applicant 30 days to respond and correct and Mr. move Mr. Anderson, forward. I'm gonna have to ask you to stop for one second. I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson, you know very well you can't speak to the merits of an application that's already pending. So uh, the record's closed. The hearing's closed. You can't speak to the application. So I can speak about the actions of council then. If correct? you want to talk about the, what happened during the minutes, that's fine, but you can't speak to this application. Okay. We'll keep it simple then. All right. Okay. Dealing with the actions in the case. The mayor is obligated to read the council in the investigation of the facts. This was not done. A motion was made by the, by, by a, the president of the that to re, um, not induce and hear Council Varney's motion. Um, city attorney was noticeably quiet and um, did not interrupt the council's declaration that they did not have the authority. That said, our conclusions are is that this council, as Samuel said to Israel, has gone astray after strange gods and prostrated yourself on the altar of development and money. The requirements were clear and they were not followed. So I ask simply that as the motion for reconsideration be considered in the decision and leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Tim Cowan. Mayor, City Council, my name is, for the record, my name is Tim Cowan, and I think I'm in Ward 7. I think. I believe you're right, <laughs> based on your address. Uh, I support uh, the repeal of the uh, Salem Payroll Tax Ordinance uh, to the extent that I think it should go before the public to vote. But before I make too many more comments than that, uh, I have the trademark as a citizen's lobbyist, and I testify and do a lot of stuff at the Capitol, so I interface with the city quite often. And I just want to say that uh, the professionalism, responsiveness uh, of the city employees are excellent. I can't think of any time I didn't get perfect support. And so I just want them to receive that compliment if I make, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, when, it, we, when I circulated the petition, one of the comments that came up most readily was uh, why the tax was necessary. And it was, the questions were centered around, was it for new items coming up on the agenda, or was it because funds had been allocated to other places and they needed to be uh, brought back in line? So that, if that has value to you. Uh, one last thing, Mayor, if I may. Uh, my background, I was a senior vice president, regional manager for First Interstate Bank. I managed Mid Valley Central and Eastern Oregon, so I went from Lincoln City to Ontario. It was about 700 plus employees, over a billion in assets, 52 branches. And of course, that involved everything that the bank did. I would volunteer to sit down and help uh, in meetings or discussions on budget and allocation of funds and things like that if it would help because I don't want to be critical of something that I haven't participated in and helped with that's all mayor thank you thank you for your testimony Matt Hale Well, good evening. Um, good evening, Mayor, City Councilors. Um, I'm Matt Hale from Ward Number Four. Uh, I'm here also to fully support uh, the motion from Councilor Julie Hoy to repeal of the Safe Salem Payroll Tax Ordinance, and urge all of you to take the first steps to do that this evening. 
I've long been a believer in the decision-making process called the Oregon Way. A recent Travel Oregon article in 2021 summarizes it very well. Uh, the article stated, it's called the Oregon Way, and it harkens back to the decision-making approach used by great Oregon politicians, namely former Governors Tom McCall and Bob Straub, former Senator Mark Hatfield and Senator Ron Wyden, who span both sides of the aisle. Senator Wyden explained it like this in 2009. The Oregon way is more about taking good ideas wherever they come from, rather than from one party or from one philosophy. Um, I would like to just uh, finally say that uh, we really need to restart this discussion. And it requires clarifying information being publicly, publicly distributed to residents and voters that I think is misleading. Um, all of us received this recently in the last month or so about safe Salem funding. And I'd just like to make uh, one comment on that. One clear example is the one page document that I just showed you. And it recently states that since 20, 2008, Salem has grown by 26,000 people, comparable to the city of Woodburn, yet we have not increased our staff, end quote. However, if you look at your fiscal year 2024 budget on page 436, it clearly shows that city staff has increased in the last six years by 165.20 FTE. That's about 14%. So I would urge all of us tonight to let's just stop with this misleading rhetoric that's going out to citizens, voters, and residents throughout the city. I'd like to also say that I would also volunteer with you, uh, Tim. I'd, I'd like to help. I'd really like to help our city. So let's come together tonight, begin the process to work together on behalf of all Salem residents and look at all the good ideas that are presented to balance our city budget. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That's everybody signed up under uh, public comment until uh, later in the agenda when we'll have the, the other roster. Councilor Stapleton, the consent calendar. I move approval of the consent calendar with um, item number 3.3A polled by Councilor Varney. Second. Thank you. Councilor. Tonight we have a bunch on our consent calendar, starting with item 3.1A, the August 14th, 2023 draft city council minutes. Item 3.2A, the internal borrowing from the city's utility fund to the airport fund for property acquisition and capital improvements. Item 3.3B, a transfer of appropriations within the city's fiscal year 2024 budget for unanticipated changes. Item 3.2C, acquisition of property for the McClay Road Southeast, a Kiplinger Road Southeast, pedestrian improvement project. Item 3.2D, the acquisition of property for uh, the 2024 pavement rehabilitation project. That's from Commercial Street Southeast, from Fabry Road Southeast to the uh, Interstate 5 ramps. Item 3.3B, the purchase and sale agreement and lease assumption with West One Automotive Group, Inc. for personal property located at 2780. 2790 25th Street Southeast, located at the Salem Municipal Airport. And that concludes the consent calendar. Thank you. Is there discussion? Seeing none, if the recorder will call the roll. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Varney. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Nishioka. Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Councilor Gwynn? Aye. Mayor Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. All right, on to public hearings. We have item 4A, a supplemental budget. Uh, and we have Josh Eggleston, our CFO. Salem City Council will now hold a public hearing uh, to discuss supplemental budget one for unanticipated city expenses related to the airport and cultural and tourism funds the hearing will begin with the staff presentation followed by public testimony individuals testifying are limited to three minutes thank you thank you and just for the for the counselor's knowledge nobody has signed up for a public comment on this one Oh. 
Good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. I'm Josh Eggleston, Chief Financial Officer for the City. I have a few brief slides to share with you about Supplemental Budget 1 and the recommended action for you this evening. Supplemental budgets are allowed when an occurrence or activity is not known when preparing the budget or previous supplemental budgets for the current fiscal year. Public hearings are required when the supplemental budget adjusts any fund by more than 10% or an expense category is being added. For this public hearing, the expense category of debt service is being added to the airport fund, which is why a public hearing is required. Supplemental Budget 1 uh, completes two separate and distinct actions. The first is the addition of revenue and expense in the Cultural and Tourism Fund for the higher than anticipated transient occupancy tax and the corresponding contractual expenses. The second action is related to the potential purchase of a property at the airport. Given the multiple reports and recommendation related to this purchase, we thought it prudent to go through the purchase in more depth. For that, I'll turn it over to Mark Bechtel with Public Works for a few additional slides. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Mark Bechtel, Public Works Operations Manager. Avello Airlines uh, will begin commercial air service at Salem Airport uh, October 5th uh, with uh, flights to both Las Vegas and Hollywood Burbank. Uh, our indications from the airline is that ticket sales are strong. Uh, one of the concerns we've had with uh, the beginning of commercial air service uh, is our supply of public parking at the airport. We currently have 155 spaces available for public parking. Uh, and I would uh, remind everyone that the average jet that will be coming into Salem will seat anywhere between 149 and 189 passengers. So parking has been a concern. We've had the opportunity uh, presented to us to address that concern uh, by means of uh, the potential acquisition of buildings and improvements uh, for a property uh, near the airport terminal. Uh, most of us would recognize it as the Hertz Auto Sales property. It's uh, actually th those improvements are owned by West One Automotive Group. The uh, the property is located at uh, 2790 25th Street Southeast, uh, immediately north of the airport terminal. Uh, it contains uh, enough space, about 3.5 3 acres, with enough space for 230 additional parking spaces. Uh, it has two buildings on the site. Uh, a office building with a little over 8,000 square feet and a vehicle maintenance building with about 3,500 square feet. Um, one of the things this would allow us to do through acquisition of this site is to then increase the amount of public parking available to us. It would also provide buildings for uh, office space for the airport as well as a uh, potential office space to lease out to other entities such as rental car, ag rental car agencies uh, or possibly another government entity. In order to make the facility connect to the airport uh, to utilize this, this property, we would need to construct uh, a sidewalk between this property and the airport terminal. Uh, that sidewalk would cost about $151,000. The property is unique in that the property itself, the underlying property owner of this property is the city of Salem. Uh, the city leases the property to Carpenter Commercial Properties, who then has been subleasing it to West One Automotive Group. So the action before you tonight would be to acquire the buildings and the improvements and the assignment of the lease uh, from West One Automotive Group. Car Carpenter Commercial Properties would continue to be the leaseholder uh, for property that we own. So uh, in order to accomplish this, uh, the purchase price is $1.4 million with taxes and closing at 31,000 uh, restriping the lot to provide the, the spaces we need for the airport would be about uh, $57,000. As I mentioned, the new sidewalk, $151,000. Uh, we have indications that the HVAC system needs uh, replacement or improvements or repairs, so a set aside of $200,000 for that. 
which would bring us for a total acquisition and utilization amount of $1.839 million. Uh, it is proposed that that financing come from the city's utility fund. I would point out that the, that amount of money is significantly, significantly less than the $2.6 million it would take to build an equivalent sized parking lot uh, on the rest of, city, of the city's airport property. Uh, so this is con considerable savings. Also, when you consider that we'd be gaining two buildings as part of that process. The annual expenditures as, as compared to revenues for this site uh, is estimated with debt service on the loan from the 10 year loan from uh, the city's utility fund at 2.83% interest. Uh, the annual debt service would begin at $210,620 per year. Uh, we would still continue to lease uh, from Carpenter Commercial Properties and the, the difference between what they pay us and what we'd pay them is about $25,000 a year. And then with utilities and other expenditures, another 50,000, uh, the annual expenditures would be b b around below $300,000 a year. Uh, the ability to charge for public parking for the airport as well as uh, lease, uh, leasing ability for parking spaces or building uh, could bring in as much as anywhere from $445,000 a year to $645,000 a year in that range. Uh, so our annual uh, revenues should be able to more than cover the annual, annual expenditures associated with the acquisition and utilization of the property. In summary, acquisition of the improvements on this property creates an additional 230 parking spaces for public parking or a combination of public and rental car parking. It is significantly less expensive than building a new parking lot of equal size. Uh, it gives us the ability to move our airport administrative offices out of the terminal building, freeing up more space for future airport expansion. Uh, also would provide leasable office space for rental car agencies or other entities. Uh, would provide a much needed uh, maintenance building uh, that could be shared between a rental car agency uh, and city vehicles so that we could maintain airport vehicles uh, on site as opposed to bringing them to the city fleet location. Uh, the amount of annual re revenue would be greater than anticipated annual expenditures. If commercial air service were to discontinue, the property uh, would have considerable resale and lease value. Uh, it's an appreciating asset. Uh, one thing we want to make, uh, uh, want to emphasize is that this internal loan from the utility fund to the airport fund does not impact the city's general fund. Additional revenue from the utilization of this property has the potential to actually decrease general fund contributions to the city's airport fund. To bring us, to bring us back to this specific recommendation, you can see the two requested budget actions here for the airport fund and for the cultural tourism fund. And this concludes the staff presentation, and we're available for questions after public comment. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. No, no we didn't have any public members sign up for a comment on this. Can you clarify on the cultural and tourism portion of this? Basically, more people are staying in our in our hotels uh, than we than were anticipated. Is that what happened here? Yes, that's correct. We're we're experiencing a higher than anticipated transient occupancy tax or TOT uh, receipts. Uh, since we're doing a supplemental budget, it seemed prudent to include it. Uh, we had identified it early in the year. Um, we had to do something for last year, so we're, we're anticipating it this year also. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Councilor Stapleton, do you have a motion? Yes, I do. I move that we adopt resolution number 2023-26 fiscal year 2024 supplemental budget increasing the airport fund and cultural and tourism fund resource and expenditure appropriations authority for unanticipated revenue and expenses. Second. Moved by Stapleton, seconded by Phillips. Discussion? Uh, sure, I'll speak to my motion. Thank you. 
Um, what an interesting opportunity uh, that was brought to us, I think, when we were uh, talking about this. Um, it just made sense. It was, it was kind of an interesting conversation to learn that we owned the land, uh, but not the improvements on the land. Um, and so just a really unique situation. Um, it makes sense to my mind um, if it costs more to build something new uh, than to buy this um, and kind of bring the whole thing back into our ownership makes sense to me. Um, I do understand the parking concerns at the airport and um, I also understand the need for some maintenance buildings. I know when I learned that currently our new um, equipment that we have for the airport is just sitting out in the rain. Um, this would give us an opportunity to have some kind of cover for them and uh, hopefully prolong their life. Um, so just a lot of uh, common sense things for me personally, um, all added up to a, a positive feeling on this. Further discussion? All right, will the recorder call the roll? Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Varney. Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Nishioka? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Councilor Gwynn? Aye. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Mayor Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. All right, on to item 5A, Councilor Hoy. Thank you. Uh, I move the following motion. That City Council conduct a first reading of an ordinance to repeal the Safe Salem payroll tax. Ordinance number 1223. I'll second. Uh, moved by Hoy, seconded by Gwen. Councilor, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In light of the city's budget crisis and the citizen response to the passing of ordinance number 1223, I'm bringing forth this motion to repeal the ordinance. Repealing this ordinance will allow us to reset and take the time we need to bring the community together on what solutions to our budget crisis they support. Repealing the payroll tax ordinance will, I believe, be the first major step toward healing. While the looming budget deficit is bad enough, a trust deficit is an even bigger problem. Since I came on board last fall, executive leadership has said we will not bring this to the voters because if we do, it will not pass. I believe the prediction is correct and the right thing to do is to stop spending on this tax. It's estimated that $220,000 more of the city's taxpayers' mon money will be spent for the special election, only to watch it failure, only to watch its likely failure we can work together to build trust. I hope you will join me in support. I am here to serve with you. Thank you. Further discussion? Councilor Nishioka. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. Um, I understand uh, the reasoning for the motion, but the, refer the referendum asked that the employee payroll tax go to the November ballot. That's what they were asking. And if we pull it from the ballot, I feel that that sends a message of not trust, that it says again, we don't trust you. So I will be voting no, because I feel that it needs to go to the ballot as the signatures on the referendum asked for. Thank, Thank you, you, Councillor. For the discussion, Councillor Stapleton. Sure. Um, thanks. I just had a question for you, Councillor Hoy. And I, I think um, when this motion came forward, I was a little bit surprised um, because I think this was um, your motion at our previous meeting was to send it to the voters in November. So, I guess my question for you is just what has changed. Um, since you made the original motion to now now taking this kind of trying to repeal it. When this came up, um, my messaging has been the same all along. It should go to the voters. Mm -hmm. And that has not changed. I wanted it to go to the voters first, if you can all recall that moment when I said, why don't we let them decide first, first right of refusal. And that was 
passed by. So then y'all went and did what you did on July 10th, and if it's not going to pass, why are we going to spend the money to try to make it happen? So that's why. Um, so when you made the motion to send it to the November ballot, did were you aware that of the costs that would be with that or okay so in our meeting originally because I was I was there <laughs> I remember it um, you made the motion to send it to the November ballot and at the time you knew that it would cost two hundred and twenty thousand dollars when you made that motion and that failed um, but now it's still gonna cost the same amount of money so I guess I'm just I'm really trying to figure out it won't cost the same amount of money if you vote to repeal it. I understand. It'll but stop, it, and we can go back to the drawing board and figure out a better solution. Folks, we need to be sure and uh, just ask our questions, make our comments, and not have just a free back and forth. Okay. Um, so my comments on this would be: um, when I first considered this whole issue, um, I knew that we needed to go to the voters at some point in time. Um, and I didn't think it was right this minute. Um, but now with the referendum, um, which was not surprising at all, we were fully prepared for. Um, we have heard from thousands of people that they want a chance to vote on this in November. Um, the folks who were here tonight and, sp and spoke to this as well, I think that they, there are probably uh, people within that rank of people who signed the referendum that maybe would like us to the repeal this. But I think on the whole, when somebody signs um, a referendum, they want a chance to vote on it. And so I, I really support uh, going to the voters in November to find out um, what they think. Um, I don't think that we have time to wait. Uh, either we're going to need to start making cuts right away, which I am not in favor of. Um, and so I, I, I will not be with you on your motion tonight, um, but I do want to continue conversations with you and with others on how best we're going to move through this um, and, and really hopefully put our city on the best financial track moving forward. I think that is all of our intents here, um, and I look forward to working with you on that. Councilor Phillips. Thank you, uh, Mayor Hoy. So uh, I think that the community has spoken rather clearly. Uh, the tagline or the name of the campaign that was successful in raising the, uh, the signatures needed to compel this to go to a vote was let Salem vote. I find that effort compelling. I think we should let Salem vote. Um, the reason I voted the way I did last month was because I wanted to guarantee raising the revenue that I and a majority of this body felt was needed to do the best service to our community, to maintain the homeless uh, solutions uh, that we've got with the managed micro shelter sites, the navigation center, um, to expand, uh, to finally get two new park rangers, to uh, expand the SOS team that's incredibly successful from four days a week, four and a half days a week, to seven days a week. These are all things that I wanted to guarantee. But if the community has, has spoken very clearly that they want to vote on this, I'm okay with that. I'm not okay with the cuts, but if the, if the citizens vote on it and the voters choose that, then we will budget within that constraint. But until that time, I wanna see as clearly as possible, I am concerned for our safety without this. Um, you know, I, I heard in the testimony earlier tonight that there's some disagreement. The facts are the facts. We have frozen our number of uh, full-time employees compared to the general fund compared to 2008, 2007. And we have grown by 26,000 people. And the call volume for EMS has gone up 80, 85% in the last 10 years. So uh, you know, every single stakeholder within the general fund budget expects full optimal funding. Uh, it's frustrating to me that those, those entities wouldn't you know, help us in this effort to raise the revenue we need to give them their full optimal funding. But I still think we need it. You know, like I'm concerned for our safety as an emergency room doctor without these revenues. Uh, I know it's an ask. Uh, it's it's a it's a bigger lift for our community. Uh, I implore them to to vote yes. Uh, it, it, when and if this gets to go to the ballot, which I think it should at this point, um, and I've gotten additional information in the in the months since we voted on this 
There are people who've told me that the only part of this they disagreed with was that we didn't send it to the voters and they intend to vote yes. Um, they found the, the testimony of uh, fellow members on this board and myself compelling and they think it's got a chance of passing. Um, you know, there are people in our community who will not have their taxes raised by this, um, but we will all benefit from this. And, and if this doesn't pass, I mean, we, regardless, we will have to address the broken property tax system that we have in our state. We will have to address the fact that, you know, as the state capital, we have close to $2 billion of infrastructure here that we're not collecting um, any revenue on, and we're providing services to those people. We have unique constraints being, you know, the second or third largest city in the state and the home of the state government. So I think this takes a step in, in addressing the crisis of how short staffed we are. Uh, the fact that we as a second or third largest city in the state of Oregon have zero people or maybe one on paper that are dedicated to communications um, and Bend has eight. The fact that we're the second or third largest city in the state of Oregon and we have only one long range uh, city planner where Eugene has eight. I, I mean, these things are deeply concerning for our ability to respond to our ever changing world uh, with many very real, I mean, the opportunity cost of what's coming over these next several years and decade, uh, I am very reluctant to ever agree to these kind of cuts. And that's, that's the trade off. If we don't do this, the cuts are gonna be very real and we're gonna find another way to make everyone upset. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? Councillor Varney. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have a lot to add. Uh, my colleagues have expressed a lot of my sentiments very, very much. Um, I think that this needs to go to the voters because we've been having a lot of discussions about trust and, um, and building trust. And I don't see how repealing this ordinance helps us to build trust. It seems like the voters want us to do something, and now we're going to try to take it away from them. And I got this visual in my head of the Peanuts cartoon, you know, with the classic every fall we watch Lucy holding the football and Charlie Brown goes up and she pulls the football. I mean, there was even a time back in uh, 61 where she said, gee, don't you trust me anymore? And then she pulled the football again. And I see that as being very similar here. You know, we say, oh, we're going to do this, and then we don't do it. And then we, do, I mean, we need to be consistent, and the voters have asked um, to make the decision on this. They've said they want to make this decision. Um, they want to drive the car, and I think we need to give them the keys. Now, if it doesn't pass, yeah, we're all going to be faced, including them, the voters, we're all going to be faced with a new reality. Um, it's going to be painful. Um, I know we all have looked at what that looks like. Anyone who sat through the budget meetings uh, and the discussions about what was coming up would have a good idea of what we're facing. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm just really hoping that the voters, when, it, when they have a chance to vote on this, I really hope that they will take the time to do the research and really understand what they're voting on. And like uh, Councillor Phillips said, I too have received emails from folks who um, plan to vote in favor of this because they do, they have done more research and they do understand the dilemma. Uh, so I will not be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? Councillor Gwynn. I will be supporting your motion because I, like you, heard our constituents say not that they wanted to vote, but they screamed very loudly that they did not want this tax. So I definitely will be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? Councillor Nerdike. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the reasons I gave for voting against the payroll tax was that it was not going to go to the voters, and I think it needs to go to the voters. I will say there are some important differences between, in Councillor Hoy's defense, between when she brought this up before and when she brought it up now. Well, now we have a $75,000 mailer that's gone out on taxpayer dime to explain why this should be done. And we didn't have the trust deficit then that we do now. That could have been avoided. 
the demand by the public to put this on the ballot was a completely foreseeable outcome of this vote. And unfortunately, now that it is going to the ballot, there are some voters who will never vote for this because trust has been irreparably damaged. They will not listen because the council did not listen. So there will be a punishment vote included in the wide number of votes on this matter, and that's unfortunate. Had this gone to the ballot, as we've done with a variety of other types of huge public investments, bond measures and so on, then we stood a better chance of it passing. But because the council has proceeded in this order, that's why you see this voter outrage. And there is little that can be done in terms of education between now and November because of the outrage, not because of their capacity to understand or their willingness to take the time. It's the fact that now they do not trust the city and they feel that the city is telling them, we know best, you don't. However, as I said, I feel strongly that the voters told me and my constituents have told me, we want to have a say in these kinds of conversations. We want to have a say on payroll taxes. And we never want to see a payroll tax pass without our input ever again. So I think that they have delivered that message to me loud and clear. And while I have reservations, I also can see the writing on the wall and see how this vote will fall also. So I think the whole situation is incredibly unfortunate. It will take years for the city to dig itself out of the hole that it's created through the way that it's proceeded with this payroll tax. And people will remember it above all other votes and all other good things that the staff and that city leadership does day in, day out. We have a lot of wonderful city staff members who just show up to do their job every day. They're not there to engage in politics. They're there to answer our 911 calls, to clean up our parks, to clean up garbage, to respond to calls for emergency services, to help young people pick out a book at the library. They didn't ask for this trust deficit. And moving forward, we'll have to find a way out of it. But my voter said very clearly to me, we want to have a say on this, and we insist that we have a say on this. That's how democracy works. So I respect Councilor Hoy's motion and its intention fully, and I appreciate your, your willingness to bring this up, knowing the likelihood of its passage and the comments you've received tonight. So I appreciate where you stand on this, but I respectfully disagree with this particular motion and I want to see what the voters have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, I wanted to share that, you know, my opinion of the um, people setting this uh, to a vote seemed to be they wanted to stop the tax and saw that this is their only way to stop it. You know, so that, that was my reading of it. And it seems to me 90, 95, 99% of the people want this, uh, do not want this payroll tax. You know, as of today, repealing is really our best option. You know, I, in my opinion, we've lost the trust of thousands and thousands of our neighbors, and that number increases every single day. And it's actually reached a new level with someone contacting us contemplating suicide. You know, so I'll be supporting Councilor Hoy's uh, motion to save us a 200,000 plus gamble of the cost going to the, uh, to the ballot. That way we can begin the healing process today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? Councillor Hoy. Thank you. First, I'd just like to point out that, uh, um, thank you, Councillor Gonzalez. I agree with you. I think that the voters would never have signed the petition if five members of this council had not passed this tax. The arguments in favor of the safe Salem payroll tax have been that the city is suffering from deficits in the general fund that will limit our ability to provide public safety and critical services. The reserves of the general fund are being depleted and the general fund will be out of money in the next couple of years. In addition to that, 
the increase in our revenues is not keeping pace with the increase in population. This has been the messaging. Today, I'm submitting this motion to repeal the payroll tax before we reach the deadline to place the tax on the November ballot. After doing some research, and I have looked at more numbers and heard about more numbers in the last few weeks than I ever have in my whole life. I have questions about the city's financial position. It appears our financial position does not match our messaging. I don't think we need the payroll tax. Based on our publicly available audited financial reports, it doesn't appear we have a financial crisis. We may have a problem creating accurate forecasts and budgets, but we don't, we don't seem to have a history of deficits. It also appears we continue to stockpile our financial reserves. According to page 49 of our 2022 annual comprehensive financial report, the general fund reported a surplus of $9,768,525 after budgeting a deficit of $1,432,330. I've seen it reported that we had a deficit of $11.2 million for 2022, but that was actually how much we exceeded our budget. See City of Salem's annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2022. The surplus in the general fund is not unique to 2022. Over the past 10 years, the city of Salem has budgeted general fund deficits every year. In some years, the deficit has been as much as nearly $12 million. Last year, it was only 1.4 million, but that assumed we would transfer $6.5 million from other funds to close the gap. But only three of the last 10 years have reported actual deficits and actual results in all 10 years have been at least $7.5 million better than budget. During the past 10 years, the general fund balance has grown from $20.8 million to $40.7 million. It doesn't look like we're depleting our reserves. See the general fund change in fund balance and general fund ending fund balance. We appear to be following the same trends for the first three quarters of fiscal year 2023. According to the City of Salem Financial Summary through Q3 fiscal year 2023 posted on the City's website, total resources were $169,342,224, while total expenditures were $120,070,000, sorry, $120,070,563. After deducting the beginning fund balance, this means the general fund again has a surplus of nearly $8.6 million through the first nine months. We appear to be on our way to yet another surplus, over $9 million, and a growth in resource revenues of almost 10% year over year. This appears to directly contradict public claims that revenue growth is not keeping pace with population growth. In addition, our ending fund balance has grown to $49,271,661. Our reserves are continuing to grow. I've spent most of my time here on the general fund. Let's consider all of the city's funds for a look at the city's overall financial picture. We seem to consistently end each fiscal year with much higher reserves than budgeted each year. Our 2022 budget expected to only have combined fund balances of $117,437,800 at June 30th, 2022. Instead, we ended the fiscal year 2022 with a combined fund balance of $379,074,800. This is an excess of $261 million. We appear to have a history of budgeting large deficits, but realizing surpluses and building our reserves. If that's the case, how reliable are the financial forecasts that show we need the payroll tax? Maybe we need to reallocate our budget to provide necessary funding for critical services like public safety, but we don't need to burden the citizens with a new tax. City Council passed the payroll tax because we were told it was necessary and we didn't believe the residents of Salem would pass the tax if given the opportunity to vote. We've already spent over 75,000 on the mailer and we're planning to spend another 220,000 to promote the tax. How many of you believe the voters will pass the payroll tax 
if they find out we don't have deficits in the general fund and we have accumulated over $40 million in reserves. reserves. It is wise for us to spend, is it wise rather, for us to spend any more money to promote this payroll tax? I ask that you join me in repealing the Salem payroll tax before it suffers defeat in the November election. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? I, I would just like to say um, we are prohibited by law from uh, budgeting a deficit. We, that's, we have to present a balanced budget at the end of every, uh, at the beginning of every year. So we, we can't actually actually budget with a deficit. We have to, we have, to have a balanced budget. Councillor Phillips. Yeah, and another thing, um, I just uh, have frustration with an expression that the city will be promoting this, uh, this vote. The staff are precluded by law from promoting anything. That's just the cost of conducting an election. That's not a promotion effort. Uh, they can only answer factual questions. So there, you know, there will be no funded effort to promote this beyond what volunteers choose to do so. So I just want to make sure that's out there. And I guess I have a second frustration. We had an entire budgeting process. We've had staff, we've had Moss, Moss Adams uh, do their due diligence in explaining to us as clearly as they can with data and audits what our numbers are. And to throw in doubt at the last minute at this time based on uh, an individual's interpretation of numbers, I find deeply frustrating. Um, I mean, I was having conversations today with our city manager about what it looks like if we do not find a way to raise revenue. And the cuts that, that are coming, uh, you know, not being able to, to staff, uh, you know, a fire station in our near future, you know, within less than 12 months, um, you know, having to cut back on patrols, having to close the West Salem Library, having to scale back, you know, hours at our main library. These are the things that are coming if we don't find a way to raise revenue. And I get that there may be some opinion that that's out there, but that's what a cold hard look at the actual number shows us. So I'm not okay with those cuts, and we can disagree, and we can try to be res respectful, but there was a whole process, and we've looked at these numbers, and I would like us all to agree to what our facts are. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? Councillor Hoy. Thank you. Um, I think in order to fully understand a budget of this size, we need more information, and we need clarity, and that, I think, would come from the auditing effort that happens every year. I think that those folks could give council the opportunity to ask questions and understand what's happening. Um, and the numbers don't lie. So I think they need another look, certainly before we implement a tax. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, my thoughts on this, somehow this conversation shifted from whether we should allow the voters to vote to whether or not the tax is needed, and I'm not sure why, how that happened or why that's the case, but I was prepared to talk about whether or not we ought to repeal this or not or allow it to go to the, to the ballot. Um, I was not in favor of sending it to the voters uh, for the reasons I've stated previously, but and that was 100% within our purview to do. That's with the, within the, the right of the council to implement a tax that, in our best judgment, was the right thing to do. We did that. And it was 100% within the purview of the voters to initiate a petition and refer it to the ballot. They, that's part of our democratic process. We did our part. The, now residents have done their part. And now it's time for the voters to vote. I think that they, I think, that if we don't allow that process to play out, I think that undermines trust, in my mind. We, we have to allow this process to play itself out. And whether, whether it's going to pass or not, I don't know. I mean, people, are, people seem to have a lot of predictions about that, but I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see if we, send it to, if we allow it to go to the ballot like, uh, like the voters have asked, we'll find out. And that's part of the process. And I think that we ought to honor that process. So that's, I, I will not be supporting the motion tonight. Further discussion? We ready to vote? All right. If the recorder will call the roll. Councillor Nordyke. Nay. Councillor Varney. Nay. Councillor Stapleton. Nay. Councillor Nishioka. Nay. Councillor Phillips. Nay. Councillor Gwynn. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Nay. Motion fails.
All right, on to item 3.3A, an item pulled from the consent calendar. Councillor Varney. Do I make a motion? Since it's the second one. Counselors, do we need to take a short break? Okay, we'll take a five minute break.
All right, we are back in session. And as a reminder, we are item under item 3.3A, and we are gonna to go to Councilor Stapleton for a motion. Thank you. I move that the council adopt a final order to affirm the planning administrator's decision to conditionally approve the consolidated application for subdivision tentative plan, urban growth area preliminary declaration, class three site plan review, three class two adjustments, tree regulation variants, and a class one design review case number. Do I need to read all that? No. Okay, no. thank you. With the, with the case number noted. <laughs> Do we have second. second moved by Stapleton seconded by Phillips counselor to your motion uh, thank you um, so this was a public hearing that we had at our last meeting um, we uh, heard a staff presentation um, this is simply moving this forward to um, to the final order and I encourage counselors to vote with me thank you counselor counselor Varney Thank you very much. Okay, the, re the reason I wanted to pull this was to bring attention. I know there was, I've received a number of emails with disappointment uh, from residents in Ward 8, um, not just about the decision, but about the process. And so I just wanted to uh, say I too was disappointed in the process, both of the both the July 24th public hearing and um, the August 14th deliberations. Uh, as for the public hearing, um, I had a number of questions, a whole list of questions I wanted to ask the applicant and I didn't feel that I ever got a chance to. And it was the way that the whole hearing progressed with questions. I mean, there weren't really questions. It was, um, we had the, the testimony by you know, the appellant and the applicant, whatever. And then we had the public comment. Uh, and then um, there was the applicant rebuttal uh, to the public comment. And then we took a break for five minutes and Mayor Hoy um, said, and then we'll have questions. That was what we had decided to do. Uh, and then we came back, uh, and then there were questions for staff, and counselors had tons and tons of questions, and they were really good. This was a very complicated decision, and there were questions about uh, ADA and, and Counselor Phillips' questions about LUBA, and there were questions about um, Dalkies, and I mean, there were, there were a whole bunch of things. There was a really good conversation going on, um, and then, Mayor Hoy said, now questions of the applicant. And then immediately, um, Dan, bro uh, Dan Atchison broke in and said, no, we need to allow the applicant to come up with the rebuttal to the staff responses. And so then that happened. And then I kept waiting to ask questions of the applicant. And then Mayor Hoy said, sorry, we're done with questions for the applicant. I've been told by council. And so all of a sudden, and I think I kind of saw a blank look on a number of folks' faces too, um, I didn't feel really comfortable with that process. And I found out later that I guess I can break in anytime and say I have questions of the applicant, but I didn't feel that that was appropriate based on the way that hearing went. Um, and then when it came time for deliberations, um, yes, uh, Mayor Hoy said we're here to deliberate and make a decision and to take the facts and apply the rules, and that makes sense. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I was under the impression that us as a quasi-judicial body that we would continue that discussion that we'd had after the public hearing, that we would discuss some of the, con the questions that both uh, the Neighborhood Association had brought up as well as a m bunch of the public testimony. Uh, and so I feel that we missed an opportunity there. Uh, and I was just really shocked that we had no deliberations. I was the only, pretty much the only one that had anything to say. And so as a quasi-judicial body, I realize um, what our role is, 
but I got the impression, did folks not have questions because they didn't review the materials before the meeting? And that was something that, that Councilor Nordyke had especially mentioned at the hearing, is make sure we read everything so that we understand you know, what's going on before we have the deliberations. Um, and so I don't know if folks didn't read it. Um, I don't know if they didn't think there was uh, about the evidence supporting it. Um, anyway, uh, there just seemed to be, I'll just say, there just seemed to be a lot of questions in my mind about how it proceeded and also if we're not going to all read through the stuff and go through the deliberations part of it as I feel we should, addressing those concerns, then I don't know, maybe we shouldn't be doing this part of the process. Um, so that's that's pretty much what I wanted to say. I felt we did a uh, disservice to the public and to the neighborhood association for not discussing it. And uh, I don't really know what happened, but I was just disappointed in the process. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor. And I apologize if there were any if there were process concerns that you didn't have addressed. I uh, and if I played a part of that, I apologize. That certainly was not my intent. And I hope that anybody feels comfortable if you if you're not sure what to do or where we're at you can always raise your hand you can come up here and chat with the city attorney you can come up here and chat with me we can take a break whatever we need to do to make sure that people understand the process it's itself and where we what we can do and you know and those sorts of things so i hope everybody can feel comfortable being able to you know pause hit the pause button and say hey i'm not sure if this is the time to do this or that, it's always okay to ask those questions. So I want, and I want to make sure that people feel comfortable doing so. So uh, please, uh, if you're not feeling comfortable, chances are somebody else isn't or unsure. And so be, you know, be sure and ask the question if, if you know, if you, if you, if you uh, need clarity on something, and we can always uh, have that conversation in the middle of whatever process we're in. There's nothing that we just have to keep rolling. We can pause and. I know that one kind of went on for a long, long time. Maybe that's, we just kind of got weary in the middle of it. I'm not sure, but Councilor Stapleton. Thank you. Councilor Varney, I just wanted to thank you for bringing this up. And again, apologize for anything that I did. I know that you had questions um, and I should have advocated on your behalf, um, even if you uh, didn't find your voice. So I apologize um, for not doing that in my role as council president. Um, to your question about whether or not um, we read or understood or got our questions answered, I will say that, um, and you know this about me, I did read the, the documentation and the emails. Um, this is especially important to me. It's, it's always important across the city, but I understand this. You know, I grew up on Orchard Heights Road. Um, I represent part of West Salem and I attend West Salem Neighborhood Association meetings, so I understand the concerns there. Um, so um, I made sure to fully understand what was happening with this moving forward. Um, so um, again, thank you for um, just your vulnerability in this and um, your dedication to your job. I really appreciate everything that you bring to this council. Further discussion, Councilor Gwynn. I just wanted to speak, um, Councilor Varney. Um, I did read the entire packet. I also went on to, because there's a link in the, um, that, that to all of the testimony, all of the applications. So I went through all of that. I also had the week before called and spoke with staff and had like an online meeting for over an hour. Um, so I didn't ask questions at at our council meeting, but I spent a lot of time. I mean, I'm sure Lisa, she's not here, but she would tell you that I asked a ton of questions and even made some suggestions that they said, oh, you can't do, we can't do that. Um, so I, I did spend hours pouring through the material. So I just wanted you to know that. Councilor Varney. Thank you. And I appreciate the feedback, I, I do. Um, when I said that, I mean, during deliberations, when there was silence, it was hard to know one way or the other what had occurred, just because it was just, <laughs> you know, nobody was saying anything like, I read through it and I feel comfortable with this decision or something. Um, 
and I got the impression, well, I did, a, an email I got, um, a resident was really angry because she said, well, if we're just gonna rubber stamp things, I mean, if people are getting that impression, like we don't read through it and we just pass things through, I appreciate what you've said because it shows that you do go through it and read it. And I too did that whole list. <laughs> so I really, yeah, there was a lot of stuff. It was big, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. For the record, I too read the packet and had a meeting with staff regarding that topic uh, prior to our deliberation. So I, I didn't have a bunch of questions past the ones that I had already asked in during the public hearing. So, yeah, Councillor Phillips. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Hoy, and thank you, uh, Councillor Varney, for pulling this and, and your comments. Um, I want to share, like, I, I acknowledge the experience. Like, I, my request to staff um, and all of us maybe would just be to get reminders on, like, when can we ask questions and to who? Because I, I lost track in the middle of that process. Now, while I admit that I lost track and I probably would have asked a question or two, it wouldn't have changed uh, my position um, on this decision. Um, I think that you know there's a housing crisis in our community and across our state. Uh, I think that we need more housing. Um, I think that as frustrating as it is to be stuck within the criteria that we're allowed to call these balls and strikes as a quasi-judicial process, uh, we're pretty constrained or completely constrained. So, you know, as a takeoff, and it might not be like the appropriate time to bring it up, I don't think that, you know, we should look at a future where we don't get involved in these processes as much where we don't actually have discretionary power. Uh, I have no fear of LUBA, but I do think it's, you know, there's a high likelihood we've been through this before as a body where we've been found incorrect uh, and you know then we're responsible for the cost of the other side as well so that's not a fear that's just money um, and I, I don't like being in that position thank you counselor further discussion will the recorder please call the roll Councillor Varney nay Councillor Stapleton aye Councillor Nishioka aye <clears throat> Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Gwynn? Aye. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Mayor Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. All right, on to information reports. Is there anything on item 6A? I, that's why I was taking that long pause. I thought I'd heard that somebody had a question on one of them. Councillor Gwynn. Hit your button for us. Sorry, go. I'm trying to, I had it and now I don't have it. Oh, there it is. Um, so looking through our, I actually sent an email to Gretchen and it, she must be Gretchen gone is or, not here this evening. Or unavailable. Um, oh, but, here she is online. Oh. Yes. You just you summoned her. That was good. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I noticed um, on page two, um, Church of the Park, there's four point three million dollars. And I understand it's pass through for grants, but I was just curious what those funds are for. Is this staffing? Is this supplies, materials, or is it mostly staffing? Councilor Gwen, Mayor and City Council, this is Gretchen Bennett responding. You'll have to forgive me. I don't have that document up in front of me. I want to ask Josh, is that our micro shelter village allocation? That's what that sounds like to me. Yeah, Gretchen, it's the grant agreement for Catholic Community Services and Village of Hope. Thank you. So, uh, Councilor Gwen, then those are the grant agreement documents that um, I think we were able to meet over one day. That includes the staffing costs, the operations costs, the uh, the physical costs, such as the cost of the property, all of the costs associated with the micro sheltering. And is that for a period of one year? That sounds like it. I think so. I, I, I That sounds correct to me. I don't have the actual document up in front of me, but that sounds correct. So one year contract, 4.3 million. And it, we don't have one contract for 4.3 million. That sounds like the combined total of the Catholic Community Services site that serves the families and the Village of Hope site that serves the individuals combined. 
Understood. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Further questions on 6A? All right, 6B. All right, that concludes the information reports. On to first readings, item 7.1A. Ordinance Bill number 1323, an ordinance relating to the Fire Prevention Code, amending SRC 58.001.003. .004, and 58.334. Thank you, Councillor Stapleton. So I'm gonna, do I have to read all those numbers? Just a question, yes? No, you do not. Okay. I move that we conduct the first reading and advance to the second reading ordinance number 1323 for the purpose of amending the CR, or sorry, the SRC, uh, to enforce the most current Oregon Fire Code adopted by the state of Oregon with local modifications. Second. Moved by Stapleton, seconded by Phillips. For discussion? Um, sure. Um, I was talking with staff about this and got you know confirmation that this is something that uh, we do periodically as things change, as science changes, and uh, we need to update codes. Uh, we do so to ensure the safety of our residents. Thank you. Further discussion? Will the recorder please call the roll? Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Gwynn. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. Item 7.1B is no longer. Uh, necessary, so we'll move on to item eight. Public comment for items other than on the agenda. So we have one person signed up, Richard Rygard. And if you'll come on up to the podium, hit the button so the green light comes on, introduce yourself and either your address or your award for the record, and you have three minutes. Hit the button there, perfect. Do I gotta hold it the whole time? Nope, nope, right. you're good. My name's Richard Rygard. I'm a homeless person from somewhere else, but I got, I have some issues with this town. Um, there was a miscarriage of justice. I got put in one of your institutions. <clears throat> and um, I wrote all the, the mayor, as I'm, I've heard, I've asked to find the letter. They can't find it. It's like, did you get it or didn't you? You know what I mean? Did the offices get my letters or did they not get them? I already talked to a few facilities already to say they never got them. You can't find one. So I was in a facility in your state, or I mean your city, and I wrote all my officials, and they're saying they never got it. So and now I'm asking you for some help now, and what are we gonna do about that? Because I went around to all your little institutions asking for help. Most places are empty. It's all remote. Ain't nobody there. And then if I'm there, they say they, don't, they ain't in that, they don't help with that stuff. And they don't know anybody. So here I am running around asking for one nation under God with liberty and justice and not getting it. What do you got to say? What, what type of help do you need? Legal help. Legal help. And I went to all my officials, wrote them all, and they're saying they didn't get it. So I tried to do what you guys wanted. And these places mailed stuff back. And now they're saying they didn't. These are your institutions that did this. Now, did they do it? Or did this institution do it? Or what? But whatever it was, it was a miscarriage of injustice. When, when you and say I, institution, I, if you don't, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you say institution, what do you mean? Do you? Okay, <clears throat> they put me in the state hospital. Okay, I so wrote. just, I, hold on one second. So that's a facility run by the state of Oregon. It really doesn't have, it is in the city of Salem, mm -hmm. but it, but I have no authority over, this, over the state hospital. That's the state government. They told me to write, I wrote the senators too. Okay. I wrote the board, I wrote the nursing. Okay. I tried to get records and nobody wants to give records. Nobody has records anymore. It's like, they put me in there injecting me with drugs, and when I wrote everybody saying, help me, they didn't, they, this is wrong, nobody showed up. And now they're saying they never even got the letter. So not only did they, you know, mistreat me, or whatever you want to call it, they made it to where I couldn't talk to all the people I needed to for help. 
Well, I'm sorry that happened to you. And so, what I would like to do, sir, is it, we're not in a position to be able to help you with your specific situation during this meeting. But what I would like you to do is maybe, I know you've been to our office previously. If you could, normally I would have you speak with Ms. Bennett. She's remote this evening. But if you could come back to our office tomorrow and get the, we can take down this specific information and try to refer you to the place you need to go. Because it's not here at the city, but we'll like help that. you find the place you need to go. Well, I've went to like the legal places and there's one that says they might take the case. They're going to check it out. Is it, was it called legal aid? No, they said no. It, it okay. was, it was, uh, there uh, might be an ombudsman's no, no, office that might be able to help. Huh. If you could come by tomorrow, okay. and we'll be sure that you get that information. No, I think it was the law center said so they might help. Okay. But I mean, I went to the legal aid. There's no, I mean, I've went everywhere in this town, and there ain't nobody there to help you. I understand. And I, I'm talking every facility, they're all empty. Here's another thing. I got a few minutes, right? Here's another thing. You guys have a housing problem. You have all these remote buildings, all these facilities. Why don't you all take one building and, you know, do like a timeshare and everybody just uses one, all the offices, and then why don't you take the other one and make apartments out of it since they're gonna all live in them and, you know, work for something else and use them buildings for something that are sitting there doing nothing, costing money. You know what, I appreciate your creative thinking on that. That's a conversation that we've been having as well as what are we gonna do with all these empty buildings and we could sure use them. You know, so if I'm you'll just, stop by tomorrow, okay. we'll work on helping you get to the place you need to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Let's see. That was the last item on our agenda. So we are adjourned. <laughs>